knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're talking about listening to God. How can we learn to hear God's voice? Now this is very important because if we want to do God's will, we're going to have to have an understanding of God's will, which means we're going to need to listen to God to hear what He's saying to us. Now in these programs we've been looking at all the ways which God speaks to us. Of course, the Scriptures bring us the very Word of God, and so we don't need to ask what, what is God saying, we just go to the Scriptures and find out what God is saying. Now, why is this so important to us to understand God's will? If we want to please God, if we want to live a life that honors God and bring, brings glory to God, then we're going to have to understand what His will is. The Bible says, don't be unwise, don't be foolish, but understand God's will. So how is this process operating in our lives? We've been looking at how God will speak to us through our circumstances. If there's a situation that we're confronted with and we can do nothing about it, we are trapped in that circumstance, people may say, well, God's speaking to you. You can't move forward, you can't move backwards, you've got to stay where you are because God is guiding you through your circumstances. Now, I've been saying to you that that is good, it's good thinking to a point, but I know many times when I've been blocked in by impossible circumstances and if I judged that to be God speaking to me, I would have stayed where I was and have made no progress in my life. Sometimes closed doors need to be kicked down in the name of Jesus and other times open doors are dangerous. You just don't go through a door simply because it's open. What if it's a, an elevator door that's open and the elevator isn't there? There's, there's a shaft that you're going to fall down. We need a whole lot more wisdom than just looking at our circumstances and saying, well, that means God is, is speaking to me by my circumstances. So we need a deeper wisdom to begin to discern what God is saying through our circumstances. But it's important to know that God does speak to us through circumstances, but we need His wisdom to discern how He's speaking to us in those circumstances. So we need more than just circumstantial guidance. We need to explore other principles which govern this listening process. And of course, Wisdom is to do with the ability to think in a godly way. God has given to us minds and sometimes when we just weigh up the situation and use wisdom and judgment that God has given to us as human beings, we can discover His will, of course, as guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So another way, the second way that I've got for you as to how God brings us into His will is through godly thinking. Godly thinking. Thank God we have a renewed mind. Romans 12 verse 10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another, with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Okay, this shows us that we have the mindset of Jesus Christ, and as we come together uh, with God's mind, we, are, we have a disposition of affection and love towards our brothers and sisters. This is the logical outworking of the mind of Christ in our experience. And so when God created us in His image, He created us with minds that He expects us to use. Matthew 22, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Philippians 2 verse 5 says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. That's a godly attitude. Yes, we have the mind of Christ. We have the spiritual mindset. Now, down through the years, many aspects of the church have at times belittled the mind, particularly in charismatic circles. Belittled the mind. We're mindless. We say we kiss our brains goodbye because the Holy Spirit's come. That is not the fruit of the Spirit in your life. God wants you to be disciplined and developed 
in your mind, in your understanding. It's as much part as Christian discipleship as speaking in tongues and prophesying and doing all the other things that the Holy Spirit comes to bring us. And so, of course, when we apply our minds to God's Word, apply our minds to seeking to understand His will, we do so in response to the Holy Spirit, and we do so with spiritual openness. I'm not saying that we worship a form of intellectualism. Intellectualism is not of the Spirit of God, but then neither is anti-intellectualism. What we have to do is to use our minds in submission to the Holy Spirit. That's why in the Sword of the Spirit series, I take you deep into the Word of God. If I do, no, if I do anything, I stretch your mind and your capacity to receive truth and to begin to grapple with it and understand with it. Understand it is a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. And so, when we come now to seek to understand God's will, we apply our mind, sanctified common sense. We apply our renewed thinking to, and to assess all the different factors to act wisely on the spiritual conclusions that we reach. Much of the time, therefore, we do not need special, supernatural, or circumstantial guidance to understand God's will. Our renewed thinking in the light of God's written word and through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to come to certain sanctified conclusions and so that we can, in a sensible way, appreciate God's will. So use your mind, use your brain, think for yourself as your mind is submitted to the Spirit of God. Then number three, we have the Spirit's witness. The Holy Spirit communicates directly to our spirit. The Holy Spirit communicates to the human spirit. He rarely speaks to us with an audible voice, which we hear with our physical ears, but He will commonly speak to us inwardly, so that we hear and discern inwardly in our spirit with that inner voice, that inner hearing of the Holy Spirit. This is your birthright. Born again by the Spirit of God, you have the testimony of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Romans 8 verse 16 says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When we are born of God, as children of God, the Holy Spirit lives within us and there the Holy Spirit will witness to us. And the first and primary, the supreme witness of the Spirit is that you are a child of God. How does this happen? Through logical deduction. I know that I'm a believer because the Bible says so. And uh, that's good, but that's not what we're talking about here. This is the direct witness of the Holy Spirit to your heart, knowing, testifying to you that you are born again. But that witness goes beyond all forms of rational, mental appreciation of the facts, logical deduction, physical stimuli, external influences, Bible doctrines. This is the Holy Spirit directly impressing on your spirit that you belong to Jesus. And that witness continues in so many respects. The Holy Spirit lives within you. He talks to you. He ministers to you and communicates to you directly to your spirit. Let me show you some of the ways in which he does this. He does this through mental or visual impressions. That's when suddenly you see something or you sense something, you feel something, you hear something in your spirit. That's the spirit imparting something to you. Now, of course, we have to learn how to judge whether that inner impression is truly from the Lord or whether it is yourself whether it's your inclinations, or a thought that somebody else has put there, or, or pizza, too much pizza, or, or, you know, or whether it's even the devil communicating, trying to put something on you. So we're going to look later on in this teaching series on how to discern and how to test these things, and it's very foolish to accept that every impression you have is coming from God. But there is a sense, a real sense, in which the Holy Spirit will teach you to discern His voice, His distinctive voice. Just like so often, when you pick up the telephone and you speak to somebody that you know very well, you just say, hi, how you do, how's, how's everything? And they say, okay, hello, Colin. 
and they know who you are because they've recognized your voice. But there are times, of course, when you've picked up the phone and, and somebody's talked to you and say, yes, thank you, great, great to hear from you, but, but who actually are you? Oh, I didn't recognize your voice. You can make mistakes, but by and large, you can get to learn to recognize other people's voices at a human level. So also you can get to hear the Holy Spirit and recognize His voice. He has a distinctive voice print. And I tell you, when you get to hear that voice and learn to hear that voice, then you can recognize it on many, many different occasions. And so, this also can work through an inner check in your spirit. This is a sense of an inner caution, an uneasiness. I don't quite feel comfortable with that. Lord, what are you saying to me? I, I feel there's a check in my spirit. And, uh, of course, this sense of unease could just be an unrecognized prejudice on your part. Oh, I don't witness to that, brother. Well, of course you wouldn't witness it to, to it, you fleshly thing, because you haven't even allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to you. It's very easy for you to dominate your own personality by your thoughts, your prejudices. That's why I've stressed all along that this is in the context of being open and responsive to God. You should be very concerned if there's any area in your life where you are not willing for God to speak to you and to bring you to the point of repentance, of a change of mind, or a change of behavior to take you further into his will. Surely, as children of God, we should be saying, Lord, here I am, speak, your servant is listening. Here I am, I'm your son, Dad, what do you want me to do? Or we say, Lord, you know, I, I, I am the clay, you are the potter, let your will be done in me today. We are responsive to him. And there may be something that God is wanting to say to you about a relationship. You feel uneasy about it. Or, or, a, or something that you're doing, a course of action that you're planning to take. And here's the Spirit saying, wait, hold back. It may be that this is the wrong course of action. Or it may be this is just the wrong timing. We have to understand the difference between God's Word, that's His general will, God's will, His specific will into your life, and God's way. God's word, God's will, and God's way. God's word is his general will to you. His will is his specific will I'm talking about now. And then his way is how that specific will is to be worked out. It could be that God's will generally is for you to preach the gospel. You know that that specifically means for you that you are called to Africa, you are called to the Benin Republic, or you are called to Albania in Europe, or you are called to Poland, and, and if these are prophecies, take them wherever you are, take them, take them, take them. Or you know you are called to the 1040 window, take it, and you, that's specific to you. But God's way is how that will is to be worked out. First of all, you need to be trained so that you're prepared, and then you need to hear specifically about the timing of how you're to go. Uh, and go and do it. And what the relationships within the body of Christ are going to be for your accountability, for your support, for your encouragement, and for your nurture and development. So God's word, God's will, and God's way. So we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit for each and every one of these things. And again, we must test and judge this feeling and any, any feeling before we act upon it. Then there is the opposite of this inner check. There's this inner release. You know, it's so frequent. Somebody says something, and you don't understand it. Wow, that has excited you in the spirit. And you know it's not some, just some logical, rational thing. And, you, and this often happens to me. Somebody is talking about something, or projects mentioned, or a nation's mentioned, and there's something in my spirit that just leaps. It's saying, yes, it's the o amen of the Holy Spirit. And you know, the Holy Spirit says amen, but he also uses modern language, not just Aramaic. Amen is an Aramaic word. The translation of that in English is not just amen, which is a good way of, of, of describing it, but it's yes, that's what it means. Yes. Yes, and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you says, oh, yes, and you just jump up and you say, oh, I'm excited. Why am I excited? The Spirit of God is dancing on the inside of me because there's a call of God upon my life. I am walking in destiny right now. I am hearing sounds of destiny right now. There's that leap of the Spirit within you as if he's doing a grand jeté across your inner experience. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's a bit of my background coming out there. And so this inner sense of peace or encouragement comes to you when you're facing a choice or a decision. You can't explain this with your mind. 
You know it's not just wishful thinking, human optimism, enthusiasm, or just mere godly encouragement. You know that God is speaking to you in that way. Number four, another way in which God speaks and brings his will to you is through a rhema word. Now, I covered this very strongly in, a, in the previous, one of the previous sessions. God's logos is his general word. God's rhema is the specific word to you in a situation. And what will happen is that you'll be reading the Bible, and then suddenly a verse will leap out of the page right in you and, and, and catch you in the eye. You think, what? I haven't noticed that before. Uh, and you've read it a thousand times, but you didn't notice it in that context. And you're all excited. God is speaking to you through a rhema word. He is selecting that word and highlighting that text, highlighting that verse, highlighting that truth or thought or principle. And it's a rhema word in your life. It's a seed thought that will transform you and bring forth fruit for the kingdom of God. It's so relevant to you. It's God's now word in your, in, in your uh, life. And of course, that rhema word will be consistent with the scripture and every other rhema word that is spoken. That rhema word will be consistent with the living word, Jesus, the logos of God. It may come through a verse of a, Bi of a Bible. It may also come through some scriptural thought that has been expressed in a spiritual song, a message, a sermon or something. And that's what happens when you preach the gospel uh, or you're preaching the word of God. Rhema words are coming to people all the time, way beyond your understanding as a preacher. And often after the service they come and say, thank you, thank you, you've changed my life, you've given me the answer. Well, what did I say? And they tell you what you've said and you thought, well, I never said that. God said that. God said that through what I was saying in your life. That's a rhema word. Then number five, godly desires. Godly desires. You know, God's will isn't always the opposite of what you feel and want and desire. I know some people today who still refuse to go to any kind of service where there's a missionary speaking just in case God will put the finger on them and say, go to Africa, go to India, go to somewhere where you don't want to go. Not suggesting that Africa and India are places to be avoided far from it. But you know, this is how some people think. This is how some people think. Psalm 37 verse 4, however, says this, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Often, God reveals his will through your desires. Through your desires. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of your desires speak about the will of God. Of course not. It says, delight yourself in God, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And so, what we need to do is recognize that God will control your desires, if you submit your life to him, and through what you desire to do in a situation, through what blesses you, through what makes you come alive, God will reveal his will to you. Now, in um, the uh, book of John, John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it will be done for you. And so, as you abide in the Lord Jesus and his words abide in you, he will guide you and lead you in your praying and in your asking according to his will through your desires, godly, sanctified desires. Then, of course, we mustn't forget that God will, number six, bring us guidance and his will through special acts of guidance. Now, we looked at Acts 16, where the Holy Spirit prevented them from speaking, preaching the gospel in, um, in, in uh, Bithynia, and in, in, in uh, Galatia, in Asia. Why? How? Well, we suggested perhaps some of this was to do with circumstances, but there was also an element, a clear element, of divine supernatural intervention, supernatural guidance, especially that vision uh, in the night. And God will at times intervene supernaturally and give you through visions and dreams and uh, amazing spiritual encounters. But we shouldn't hanker after these things. We should test them very, very carefully at all times. We shouldn't hanker after them and neither should we at any time, uh, as it were, depend on these uh, as if that was the only way in which God leads and God guides. I've had many dreams and visions and supernatural words and encounters, divine encounters, 
angelic encounters where God has communicated his will. But these things are, when I say many, I think many over a long lifetime. It's not, you know, it's not something that happens every day. Then number seven. We need to see that God will guide and lead through the gifts of the Spirit. Now, in the manuals on knowing the Spirit and ministering the Spirit, we look at the gifts of the Spirit, and we're going to also come back in later sessions to look at the specific revelation gifts of the Spirit through which the Holy Spirit will speak. But we're talking about prophecy, personal prophecy, congregational prophecy. These things must be weighed, judged, tested, and sifted. And we're going to look at how to do that in one of the later sessions. For now, let's point out that no prophecy should ever supersede God's word or contradict God's word. If there's a discrepancy between a prophecy and the scriptures, then the prophecy should be rejected. Now, I also uh, stress that personal prophecy is a biblical function and that God will can and does speak to people through personal prophecy, not just congregational prophecy, generally through people to, to, to the whole congregation. Uh, he will speak also personally. But we must sift and test, uh, not treat prophecies with contempt, but to test all things that we might hold on to all things. Now, in general, personal prophecy and indeed congregational prophecy should confirm what we sense God is already saying, should witness to us that this is what God is saying, should never be an attempt to manipulate or control people, and it should conform to Scripture and renewed, sanctified common sense. And we're going to look later on at personal and congregational prophecy in detail, but I just mention it now so you've got a complete picture of how God reveals His will to us. Number eight, the fruit of the Spirit. Not just the gifts, but also the fruit. You see, when we walk in obedience to the Lord, He produces His fruit in our lives. So that means, as we are listening to the Spirit and moving accordingly and following the Holy Spirit according to the will of God, then there will be fruit produced in our lives so that we can generally tell that if the direction we're going in is correct by looking at the fruit of the Spirit, that that course of action and events, uh, that decision has actually produced in our lives. What's the fruit of it? Is it producing the fruit of the Spirit? And so, even when God is dealing with us and speaking strongly to us, and uh, this whole question of personal prophecies in recent publications, international Bible teachers have pointed out that this should not be used simply to flatter people and to you know, give them high-sounding encouragement on the pretext that prophecies for edification, exhortation, and comfort, when God can speak strong words to us, and words which are words of, 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 of correction, and even words of rebuke. But in the midst of all of that, we should know that God is ministering His love and His peace to us. And so, it's not merely that the fruit of the Spirit is the result of us hearing from God and walking in His way, also, the fruit of the Spirit is the way of testing whether God is speaking in the first instance. And so, when we hear the Word of God come to us, is this something with which we have a sense of peace? Is there a sense of God's joy and love welling up in our hearts? That's a way of discerning. Number nine, we need to see that God will guide us through godly counsel. In uh, Proverbs 12, verse 15, it says, the, f the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Proverbs 15, verse 22 says, Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. And so we must submit what God is saying, what we think God is saying us, to godly counsel, to mature believers, to say, can you help me weigh this? And their advice, their counsel is going to be crucial. But remember that we mustn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, as it says in, in Psalm 1, and we must test all counsel and all guidance that people are giving us against the Word of God so that we don't get led astray because Godly counsel is good, but we can still be wrongly counseled, and we're responsible before God to receive the counsel, to act on the counsel we receive in a sensible fashion and to test it out. Then finally, number 10, there's the principle of agreement. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything shall be established. Here, God is saying to us 
that we should accept his spiritual principle of agreement. I call this prophetic alignment, prophetic agreement. In other words, God will speak to us and that will come by way of confirmation. He won't just speak to us in one way, he will speak to us in lots of different ways and it builds up a kind of pattern in our life. And so we must look for confirmation before we accept that a prophecy or a word of knowledge or some other method of guidance is truly from the Lord. Now I think however it's presumptuous to say well God I see it written in the word I see it but I'm not going to accept that you're going to have to confirm that to me. If you behave like that where God has spoken to us clearly and infallibly in the scripture then you are stepping outside of his will if you ask him to confirm it. God does not have to confirm his written word to us. He, he, if he wants to, that's his business. But he, he doesn't have to, and if we expect him to do so, that's presumption, and we can actually be led astray, just as Balaam was led astray. God told Balaam not to go and prophesy, and he said, show me a sign, do you want me to go? And God said, okay, go. But then he dealt with him on the way, and, and he said, you have disobeyed me, you've fallen short. And so we can't presume to expect God to confirm uh, that to if he speaks to us from his word, says adultery is wrong, you say, well, okay, let me just go and test this out to see if adultery is wrong. You are going to end up into big trouble that way. And I know people who have because they have failed to hear in that the clear word of God. Well, there we have it. Ten major ways in which God communicates his will to us. And you need to go back over those ways and become familiar with them because God will use them in combination with so many ways in which the Spirit will speak to you so that you can come to an understanding of his will. And this is the end of this particular teaching, but we're going to come back to see how we can put that will into practice and to move forward in our prophetic ministry in understanding to how we can listen to the voice of God. God bless you.